The crucifixion story is the most historicising part of the Jesus narrative, because the most credible and parsimonious explanation is that it started as a historical fact. Mythicists struggle to explain how it got into the story by any other means. The Swiss psychologist Carl Jung may afford such an explanation. To examine this, we will have to step outside of the familiar field of first century history and texts, and into the less familiar one of Jungian psychology. This is further complicated because Jung's methods were not up to snuff in modern scientific terms. So we need to extract from Jung only that bit which is credible and not rely on his abundant fantastical speculations. Jung was what we would now call a psychotherapist. He was a capable man with substantial professional success and extensive experience in his field. He had a detailed knowledge of the thought processes of his patients, a knowledge that most of us can't hope to acquire because it relied on extensive discussions with patients about the intimate details of their thoughts under the protection of the doctor-patient relationship. He was adept at pattern recognition and he was successful at developing general principles of thought and behaviour, many of which have proved to be durable. So, for example, he came up with a scheme for classifying personality types and he drew a distinction between temperament and persona, where our temperament is the nature of our personality, which has attractive and unattractive aspects. Our persona is the person we present to the outside world, which displays the desirable characteristics of our personality and suppresses the undesirable. The maintenance of this persona requires effort, and under stress, when spare effort is limited, our behaviour reverts to that native to our temperament. This accords with more recent clinical data and common experience. A loving, sensitive person under stress remains loving but becomes emotional and incoherent, whereas a logical person under stress remains logical but becomes thoughtless, hurtful and even cruel. So far so good for Jung, but he discusses Jesus mainly in his book Eon, which is not about that kind of behaviour. Jung, and Freud as well, developed complicated theories about the unconscious mind. There is an unconscious mind, and it is complex and interesting. Modern understanding of it is based on multiple experiments on things like the influence of stimuli that are below the threshold of consciousness on behaviour. You probably know about things like experiments on subliminal advertising, but that's not what Jung did. Instead, he developed his theory of unconsciousness by inference from observation on the conscious minds of his patients, from introspection, and from studying myths, legends, and religious traditions from around the world. Experiments are devised by working out how different predictions of competing theories compare with results. Jung's methods did not involve the comparison of competing theories. Instead, it was the progressive elaboration of one theory to fit an ever-widening evidence base on the one hand, and on the other hand, an ever-widening field of application. To modern eyes, Jung was a capable innovator, but suffered from data selection, anchoring and confirmation biases. The word eon means age, and refers to the great month. I explain this in my video on the 70-year argument. Briefly, a great month is one twelfth of a great year, the time it takes for the equinox to precess around the 360 degrees of the heavens. A great month is about 2,000 years. The eon in question is that from around 1 to around 2000 AD and is referred to as the Age of Pisces. We are now passing from the Age of Pisces into the Age of Aquarius. In Eon, Jung argues that the mind has a circular chain of four links that have always been there. The Eon of Pisces consists of four 500-year phases of intellectual progress that correlate with and were caused by these links in the chain of the mind. The book starts with four short chapters on Jung's view of the psyche, summarised in this diagram which illustrates not only Jung's view of the psyche, but also a major problem we have in interpreting it. So let me redraw it. We have the persona, which I just discussed, the ego, which is our conscious mind, then our unconscious, which contains two groups of contributing factors, 
the personal unconscious, which is based on our own prior experiences, and a collective unconscious, which is innate and common to all people, and contains drivers towards particular motivations and judgments aimed at evolutionary survival, such as nutrition, reproduction and security. Within the unconscious is something that Jung calls the shadow, that contains things that are part of our mind but are suppressed from the conscious mind because they are undesirable, a borrowing from Freud. One component of the collective unconscious that ends up in the shadow is part of the syzygy, which is connected to gender and contains two parts, the anima and the animus. These are the mental characteristics of the sexes. So the anima is nurturing, caring and kind for females and the animus is objective, territorial and acquisitive for males. Broadly, in males the anima is suppressed into the shadow and in females the animus is. An aspect of Jung's theory is that when I do this suppression, as a man, I tend to throw the baby of my anima into the shadow with the bathwater and end up suppressing valuable characteristics which I would be better to bring out of the shadow and into my ego, and conversely for women. So far we may not believe his scheme, but at least we can work out what he's talking about. However, when it comes to the self, Jung loses us, because on the one hand the self is the whole shooting match, but on the other, it's some kind of waiting system for all these other components that we can adjust with therapy and introspection in order to optimise our mental health. Well, that's my spin on it, but it's clearly not what Jung meant. What he did mean is something that I can't understand and I never will be able to. To get this, we need to divert again, this time into the field of personality type, which is another discipline of which Jung was a founder. Currently there are two models of personality type that are widely used and these are those based on Jung and those based on what's called the five-factor model. The five-factor model is the most scientifically rigorous but it's the Jungian model that has attracted the most lucid commentary and the version of it that I find most useful is that of David Kiersey whose book Please Understand Me Too I recommend if you're interested in the topic. Kiersey divides people's personalities into four broad groups rationalists, idealists, artisans and guardians. Of these, idealists are in a fairly small minority and make up less than a quarter of people. These idealists do not think the way you and I do. We look at things in terms of manifest evidence, how to explain it and how to use it to develop theories to predict future events. And this is done in communicable language and numbers. Idealists are looking for something quite different. They're looking for deeper meaning, harmony and peace. And this is done in their own conceptualisation, which we don't share, and primarily not with language and numbers. One idealist can successfully invoke feelings and thoughts in another idealist who has a common experience of them by describing them in language. But that language is pretty incomprehensible to us non-idealists, and it always will be. Returning to this diagram, Jung's self was straight out of his idealist mind and he would regard my description of it as a waiting system, as hopelessly shallow and reductivist. That distinction between personality types is the reason why I dismiss Jung as non-specific babble. It's not because he necessarily is babble, but that he appears that way to me. But, to fellow idealists, Jung gets to a deep and important truth. Eon ends with a rather apocalyptic prognosis for the world, and his fellow idealists find this deep, meaningful and frightening, whereas I find it crass. The most prominent idealist relevant to this issue at the moment is, I would say, the famous Canadian psychoanalyst Jordan Peterson. You just have to read what he has to say about Jung and try to work out what on earth he's talking about in order to see the truth in what I'm saying. Now let's get back to Jesus. Jung regards Jesus as the archetype of the self. In other words, the Jesus of the Christian church is the result of the outworking of the collective unconsciousness through centuries of study, introspection and expression. I would add amongst idealists who are drawn to religion. 
That means that the things we find in the story of Jesus have their origin in the human psyche. Some things may have their origin in history, but they are only in the story as they were selected by humans from history because of the meanings they carry. Jung was attracted by the idea of complementary opposites, like the anima and animus. Similarly, there is damnation and redemption, rejection and acceptance, suffering and elation, life and death. Idealists seek an understanding of the human condition that seems to be analogous with a unified field theory, where these opposites are explained by some deeper understanding that not only explains them but also informs how to manage them. It seems that this deep understanding cannot be expressed in language, which is why idealists make extensive use of metaphor, allegory and parable. Now, let's suppose that Mark's Gospel had the purpose of conveying this deeper meaning. While we may not be able to divine that meaning, we can recognise some of the themes being used to express it. Themes like damnation and redemption, life and death, denigration and glorification. Many stories that deal with these issues bring their protagonists to maximum levels of suffering and then glorification. But Mark isn't doing that. If we use the terms in the way they are used in mathematics, Mark is not bringing Jesus to a maximum of suffering, but to an asymptote or limit, a point beyond which not just Jesus, but no one can go. Crucifixion is a pretty good end point for that project but crucifixion alone wouldn't be particularly convincing that this is what Mark is up to, because suffering can always be increased from the simply physical by adding to it mental suffering like betrayal, injustice, rejection and failure. So let's have a look at Mark and see whether he's just looking for a peak physical suffering or going for the total limit. Mark 11 verse 22, after the fig tree debacle, Peter says, look, the fig tree has withered. And Jesus says, truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. This is to remind you of the power of God and specifically his unwillingness rather than his inability to intervene in what follows. Mark 14 starts with the anointing feet episode and the Last Supper, then Gethsemane. Jesus gets deeply distressed and troubled and goes to pray. And the others can't stay awake. He prayed that if possible the hour might pass from him, but thy will not mine, etc. Then he goes back and finds them sleeping. This happens three times. This is the beginning of a downhill trajectory of lack of support. Then he gets betrayed by Judas, one of the outer circle. The men sent from the high priest arrest him. All those with him desert him and flee, including the young man in the linen garment who flees naked. He's taken to the Sanhedrin and convicted, though innocent. He gets spat on, blindfolded, punched and asked to prophesy in mock. The guards take him away and beat him, so it's getting pretty bad and at this point he's betrayed by Peter, one of his inner circle. He gets hauled off to Pilate who prevaricates and offers the crowd a choice between a murderous criminal and Jesus. They choose the criminal, i.e. the people have turned against him. Pilate asks the crowd what he should do and they say crucified him. Pilate asks why but they shout all the more crucify him. Soldiers take him away, put on a purple robe and a crown of thorns, mock, spit on and beat him. They put his own clothes back on and haul him out to be crucified. Simon of Cyrene is forced to carry the cross. We're not told why, but the implication is that Jesus was too weak. His powers are deserting him. The mocking and abusing go on while they crucify him, with two rebels, one on either side, who join in. No thief is saved in Mark. Then at three in the afternoon, Jesus cries out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So now everything's gone. His strength is gone. His powers are gone. His God has forsaken him and he is subjected to a humiliating death. Rejection by God at the end is not included in the other Gospels and maybe that's spoiling the story because Jesus has descended to such a bad situation it's difficult to see how it could have gotten any worse. Why did it end this way? 
Was it because he was crucified, or is it because the storyteller intended to get him as low as he possibly could, and this is the point where he runs out of road? That is certainly the way the story looks, and if that is the case, we don't need a historical crucifixion to explain how it got into the story. That is, unless you can think of any death that would fit the purpose better. And if the crucifixion was real, that now seems mighty convenient. Jesus dies and is then raised. Mark cuts off abruptly, but we know from Paul that his audience already had a pretty clear idea about the marvellous CV of the resurrected Jesus. We can see how this might appeal to the Jungian mind. Descent into the lowest depths, death, exaltation to the highest, to convey a profound and eternal meaning of salvation. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 1.23, notes that crucifixion is a stumbling block for Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. They didn't get it. But what they didn't get was nothing to do with history. I don't get it either, but maybe the story was never aimed at us. We focus on historical accuracy, but perhaps for Mark, that was never the point. 